Coming up on Radically Rational, the podcast, a conversation with one of America's fastest rising young documentary filmmakers, Peter Pardini. You're not going to want to miss this. We're Radically Rational. And welcome to Radically Rational, the podcast. We appreciate your being here. Also want to ask you to visit our website at radicallyrational.com. At Radically Rational, we're bringing facts back into fashion. And we're making simple sanity sexy again, for goodness sake. And if I violate that rule, I will get chastised by an eight-year-old girl. Did it take you all day to come up with that? And I have learned not to argue with her. Okay, part of being rational in my estimation, is living your life to the fullest and pursuing your passions. That's not only fun, that's not only spiritual, that's rational. So we are delighted to have as our guest one of the fastest rising great young documentary filmmakers in America, Peter Pardini. I have been a fan of yours for a long time, and the chance to meet you face-to-face, this is great. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Now, here's the thing. This is the first thing I wanted to ask you. Okay, I'm a native Texan. I was born here, so I kind of got a free ticket, but you went out of your way to move here. Much respect. What was that all about? Driving around in Los Angeles and seeing that uh, buying a house was was probably not going to happen, (laughs) and then looking in Austin and seeing, oh, we can get a house right now, but overall, it was just, I don't know, just wanting to start a family and living in an apartment in Los Angeles and not really happening and all the projects that I had done in the in you know before were basically self-started and my wife and I we basically self-start the project so we decided to take the uh the chance and move somewhere and see if we could do it anywhere and we we've been able to so far and you're living in Georgetown which I think is such a great selection that is a unique community is it's really located in a great place just north of Austin but there is a Georgetown feel so what attracted you to that community in particular well we we were looking and we looked in Austin we looked in Round Rock Pflugerville Georgetown and it just so happened that everything about the city was attractive i mean that we found our favorite house of all the ones we looked at um, the downtown is great. Um, it just, to put it simple, I mean, just we, we liked everything about it. And just this, I guess it's a small town feel, but also close to a city. And, um, you know, lots of things to do in Austin, obviously. So close enough, but not right in a city where you're on top of everyone. In, in terms of your industry, is it a good place to be or does that just not matter anymore? I don't think it doesn't matter. I mean, one of the reasons we did pick Austin was because there is a it's known for its its film centric mm-hmm. um, yeah. past, and you know, there's obviously some well known filmmakers who've started their career there. Um, but it was mostly just wanting to go somewhere that was close to it, but it wasn't the only thing that everyone lived there talked about or thought about or pretended as if they were part of because in Los Angeles you know most of our friends are in the film industry but it feels like everywhere you go everyone's quote unquote in the film industry right. but that's sort of impossible because <laughs> there's only so many spaces and you know knowing how much we've done and still feel like oh man we've got so much more to go it 
feels healthier to be somewhere where not everybody is like competing with each other to almost be better than the other person rather than just being talking. the best you you can yeah. be. No, I, I, I absolutely get that. One of the reasons I love doing this so much is because I'm just so fascinated with human motivation. And the most interesting question I can ever ask anyone is why? Because that gets to the basis of motivation. So why filmmaking? Man, when I was really young, I mean, I just loved movies. Um, I think the first time that I thought about the filmmaking aspect was Raiders of the Lost Ark mm -hmm. when I was watching it with my mom and the scene where he's being pulled behind the, the car towards the end. I was like, how did they do that? Because it's Harrison Ford being dragged behind it. And that was kind of the first time I thought, how did they actually how, shoot how that? How they do it, yeah. And, and then I had some friends who I went to grade school and high school with who we all sort of started making movies together. And uh, it just was a bunch of things like that that led to filmmaking and really getting the bad stuff out of the way when you're in eighth grade and then in high school, you're making things that when I eventually went to college and saw what other people were making, I realized, oh man, they're, they're doing what I did in eighth grade now. <laughs> you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I was very fortunate that I had people around me who not only supported me, but then also friends who made movies with me in high school. Okay. Well, take me back to the Peter Pardini childhood chronology. <laughs> Where did we have the moment at which, when I grow up, I'm going to be a filmmaker? Man, probably like eighth grade or freshman year of high school. Yeah. Yeah. I would go to the video store, if not once, probably twice a week. And it's something now that I look back on and I feel like I should be doing now. But I would watch probably six, seven movies a week. And the more I, I would pick a filmmaker at a time. So my first obsession was Harrison Ford. I watched all his movies. I'd get the TV guide, find out where the movies were going to play. So I'd find like a random one, Frisco Kid. Where, where's that going to play? And I'd record it on TNT or wherever it was. And I would move through filmmakers like that until, you know, when I got into college, I was way into making movies and we had already we shot a movie in high school we did a whole feature film that we shot over a year and a half and showed to um we showed it to probably we sh had two screenings at a local school where we had 200 people at each screening because everyone who was in the movie invited everyone they knew and it did not go over well <laughs> and it was kind of that first time where you showed something and it was you had you had to show an audience and see how people would react to what you had made and uh, it was good to get that out of the way when you're 17 versus, you know, 28 and you think you've done something really great and then you have a reality check. <laughs> so, <laughs> You are a very versatile filmmaker, but a lot of your prominent work to date has been in the documentary genre. What's unique about that and what attracted you to that? Well, in high school, I, um, towards, so in senior year, um, we had three future NBA players on our high school basketball team. Um, we had Brook and so Robin. So there, there's a lot of banners in your gym. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we had Brook and we had Brook and Robin Lopez. Um, oh, that doesn't hurt. Yeah, and then Quincy Pondexter, who played for the Spurs here yeah. at some point. Um, and I took a camera out with uh, my friends and I went and went on a road trip to watch their playoff run, and I filmed that whole thing and put it together as kind of like a dual documentary about friends going on a road trip. I mean, it was our first time going anywhere alone as 18 year olds and also about that playoff run. Um, and what I like about it is I really like editing. So it was a way for me to force a movie to be made. I, I could just shoot something and make a whole feature film and not rely on anybody else. Right. Um, and to a certain extent, I mean, going through Chicago, um, obviously you need funding to do something like that, but I had gained enough experience doing, I mean, when I went to college, I did the same thing. I just filmed stuff and put something together and no one's seen these things, but I was always drawn to shooting something and putting it together and, um, you know, 
doing the Chicago one, I could basically get a crew together, shoot the thing, and then everything else is up to me. I could control the movie. Whereas with narratives, I mean, I would love to make more narrative right. features, but it requires so much more planning and obviously money <laughs> that is hard to come by. Um, and the ironic thing is just documentaries are just so much easier to find funding for now because there's just a hunger for reality, I guess, in, in the sense that, but reality through a cinematic lens. Well, since you mentioned it, let's talk about the Chicago Project. That's the documentary that you did on the legendary band Chicago, and it is just incredibly well made and full disclosure you guys know this I, I may actually be the world's biggest chicago fan I, i've seen that band play 85 times since 1973 and there is a dynamic there first of all they truly did invent a sound but to see the way they have evolved not just as a band but as individuals and as people over the last 55 years just absolutely astounding, and, and I, this had to be fascinating for you a, as a filmmaker. These are interesting dudes. Yeah, when so I originally started with the group just as a tour videographer, and would just film them from city to city and put almost you know now YouTube's such a big deal, but even in tw 2011 when I started, it wasn't really YouTube was still kind of just cat videos and political videos, but not the way it is now. And they were doing something pretty interesting where they would release on their site just short mm -hmm. video, like vlogs. Um, but at a certain point, uh, the History of the Eagles documentary came out, and Lee had called me, Lee Lochnane, and had asked if I had seen it. And he said, do you think you could do something like that? And I said, you two are pretty good Lee, <laughs> yeah, by the way. Yeah. That was not bad. I talked to him all the time. <laughs> yeah, but so I, I said, yeah. And we started working on it right then. I mean, we didn't know how much it was going to cost. And he always says it's like a shoestring budget that got the shoestring kept getting longer. longer. <laughs> um, but it eventually we had a movie. And for me, as I went to college for screenwriting i didn't go for directing because cal state northridge where i went in, in los angeles didn't have a directing major and the closest thing they had was screenwriting and so i learned story structure there and that's the foundation so that was a very logical choice yeah, yeah. and the interesting thing i mean they even say it in the eagles documentary uh, joe walsh says um you look when you're in it it feels like a mess but when you look back on it it's like the greatest story ever told it's something like that paraphrasing and it really, I mean, looking at Chicago's career, there was clear turning points in their career that I was like, all I have to do is ask these guys these questions, let them tell the story, and then, like I said, I can go and edit it and put it together. Um, but the thing I find most fascinating about them as individuals, like you said, is they're, they were all, the original guys, so different. Mm -hmm. I mean, Robert... And Lee couldn't be any more opposite, um, but somehow the same. Jimmy, it, Jimmy and Walt and Robert and Lee are kind of the two different like versions of the same coin. And you know, then I met Danny Seraphin, who's very different. Who, by the way, has been our guest on this podcast, and he was incredible. Yeah, I mean, we went to his house and uh, interviewed him, and it was interesting to see someone who obviously had some acrimony and things happen sure. with the band. But the stories, even though he had a completely different perspective on it, the stories were still the same. Right. Which I found that was, they're also different, yet they told the same stories in slightly different ways. But when you edit it together, they're completing each other's sentences. Um, in a way, it was very easy to edit and also hard to edit because you want to make sure you're telling the story the best way possible because you know a lot of... I, Having been touring with the band for two years, you realize how much the super fans, I, I, I mean, the people who followed them since the beginning... You know, the crazies. Well, like, yeah. no... <laughs> Go ahead and say... <laughs> it's, Chicago's the biggest indie band of all time because they have fans that have been there since the beginning and that grew from them. Yeah. And you see how much people care about this group more than... 
like someone talking about the Beatles, like everyone just kind of, oh, the Beatles are the best. Mm. But I saw how much it mattered to people. So it was hard to edit in that sense where you didn't want to get anything wrong. And then of course you, you finish it and there's always going to be complaints, you know, but you got to kind of live with what you put together. But Peter, it was yeah. so well received. And by the way, the name of the documentary is now more than ever, which is a quote from a movement written by Jimmy Panko mm-hmm. in, in the famous ballet for a girl in Buchanan. Um, don't be modest. You have cleaned up on that when it comes to awards. I mean, really well received. Oh, it was, I mean, the realization that after, yeah, it was, took about four years to make and then it, aired on CNN and got I like something like 2 million viewers. And that was, for me, I was 29, I think. And, or maybe if I had just turned 30. Yeah. And the realization that over a million people had seen something you worked on was very gratifying. But I think the most gratifying was being even at the Sedona Film Festival um, and showing it for the first time because I had never shown a movie that I had done since high school. So my last... That had to be a kick, though, right? So my last experience was people being kind of like, yeah, that was good. That was good. (laughs) And so I was worried it was going to be the same thing, but... (laughs) It got better. (laughs) They had just... So Chicago had... There was an interesting thing that happened. Chicago, in the original cut of the movie, hadn't been inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And so the whole end of the movie was... Uh, they're not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and it's a travesty that they're not in. And then as we're about to release the movie, <laughs> they, they, they get, get elected. In. There we and go. I was like, Are you kidding? <laughs> so, but then I thought, okay, well, we can, what we can do is we can go and film them getting into the Rock Hall, which is what we eventually did. But for this film festival, I'll put on the Chiron at the end, on the bottom of the screen, just say Chicago was inducted. Which in worked, sure. The whole audience standing ovation at, at that moment. The movie wasn't even over yet, and that felt like, oh, man, like, I, the movie's good. People like it. And then, of course, we went and reshot and put them getting into the Hall of Fame in, and that's what everyone, like, most of the public saw. But my first experience with getting a reaction to it was in Sedona, and, uh, yeah, it was awesome. I've had the pleasure of speaking with you on the telephone maybe almost a half dozen times. It's absolutely been great. First time I've had the pleasure of meeting you face to face, and you just said something right before we came into this studio that d- really got me going. You're all about next. So what's next? Man, um, I, my wife and I are working on um, a narrative feature right now. We just shot a teaser for it in Austin. Um that we've been, I mean, we've been working on getting going for about five years now. Um, and it's about the origins of Indian casinos. And, wow, you know, that's the background of it, but it's more in the style of, I, I would say, the Coen brothers or something, um, where it follows this hitman who's trying to get involved with his identical twin brother's casino business. And the person that I always envisioned for it was Wes Studi, who has been in everything. I mean, if you don't know the name, you definitely know the face. He was in Last of the Mohicans, Heat, Hostiles, Mystery Men. I mean, he's been in everything. He was Geronimo. Um, And lo and behold, we reached out, and he was interested in doing it, and so we shot the movie with him and uh, shot a short teaser for it, and that's where we are with that. But, you know, I'm also doing a reality pilot for... A sports show. I'm also doing, um, let's see, another Chicago documentary. So never enough. Never. Well, enough. it's always trying yeah. to do something that might lead to more, and yeah. you know, inevitably it has. But um, you know, the ultimate goal is to make narrative feature films. Um, but in the meantime, I mean, I'm fortunate enough to not have to have a quote unquote real job. Um, and I'm able to focus solely on making projects. What's a good day for you professionally? What do you mean? (laughs) What what constitutes a good day? You know, like, for example, I'm a list maker. You know, in a day when I have crossed everything off my list, even if it's just mundane, that's a very satisfying thing to me, just kind of taking care of business. When you get through with a very long work day, how do you assess it? What makes it a good day for you? When you 
Yeah, when you feel like you've made progress on something that you've been thinking about for a long time. I mean, I just, I, earlier this year, edited a project I had been thinking about for years, and finishing something, it's not, it's usually not when something's finished. I mean, I'm always moving on to the next thing every day, and my wife will tell you, too, that I have a hard time turning it off. So I have to actually work on being, I don't want to say grateful, but recognizing when I've done something. Yeah. Um, because that's probably part of the reason why I keep moving on to new things. Mm -hmm. But I would say a good day is very similar to what you're saying. Like, not necessarily a concrete list, but when the day before you're worried about doing the thing and then you do it, nothing bad happened. You know what I mean? So it's like a, a good day averting. is the absence of bad. I mean. <laughs> yeah. The averting the crisis that never was there. Yeah. yeah. Good day. yeah. Even, even better for yeah. sure. Um, you've talked about wanting to move on to feature films in particular. And I'm fascinated by the way that the sausage gets made here. Um, I'm very blessed and very lucky that I have, made my living as an adult for the most part as a fact-based storyteller. So there's some similarity in what we do. But we were having some fun with this on the phone the other day. The difference is deadlines. You know, I've, I've worked in an industry where the deadline was 10 minutes ago. Yeah. that It's a rush, but there's really a lot of pressure there. So what, what creates that kind of similar pressure for you? Procrastinating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's interesting you try to get into this this quote unquote industry that there's no way to get into and you're constantly being reminded of I could reference another text in Mark Cuban saying well if you're not if you're not up at five in the morning and someone else is working and it's like mm, I agree with that to a certain extent only if we have the definition of working because for me like I was saying I'm pretty much every waking hour thinking about what I'm doing, I might not be sitting at a table doing the thing, but I'm constantly thinking about it. And one of my strengths is my ability to visualize in my head what I want the eventual project to be. And to other people, it might look like procrastinating, but I'm actually just formulating it until I actually sit down and do it. Like I just edited something that I just did it in like three weeks but I was thinking about it for seven months. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So the pressure for my strength is being able to, from the outside, look like I'm procrastinating, but then go and just do it. So I guess that's an answer. It's kind of like the swan on the lake. A yeah. lot going on beneath the surface there, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Okay, full disclosure or maybe confession. My favorite movie of all time is The Right Stuff. It's my favorite movie. I've been trying to – it's so long. It's, we've it's, been trying to yeah, you, you got to have to invest yeah. a couple of evenings. But, but <laughs> yeah, and there's a lot in there that I loved. Of course, it's about the Mercury program and uh, the space race and the competition with the then Soviet Union. And there was a lot in there that said, no bucks, no buck Rogers. Same kind of deal here. I, no bucks, no movie. I, I'm fascinated about how you generate funding for projects like that. That I mean, that that takes some chutzpah. How do you do that? Well, it's only happened a few times. Um, so for Chicago, I mean, they. I was just fortunate that they're a successful band for 50 years and were able to front that. Mm -hmm. um, then for another documentary I did um, called Fat, a documentary, uh, which came out a couple years ago now, um, I never thought in my life that I would make a Chicago documentary and then make a health documentary that seemingly, I don't want to say did better, but was just as popular as the Chicago one. Mm -hmm. Because I was just approached to do, I went on a podcast to talk about the Chicago documentary coming out on Blu-ray, and I met this guy who's a, a, a health expert. His name is Vinny Tortorich, and he invited me on his podcast, and we started talking, and he said, would you be interested in doing a documentary about the history of 
food guidelines in the United States and the, you know, like the food pyramid and health myths and the things that we believe about health that maybe aren't true based on these guidelines that we have. And I said, yeah, that sounds interesting. And he, we did a fundraiser and he was able to raise quarter of a million dollars from people he had helped lose weight over the years. So people who had lost 95 pounds were giving $95 and he he's known for helping people for free. He puts out this PDF that people can download and basically just lose weight by following what is on there and he doesn't charge anything for it. So it kind of came back in spades for him. So that was one project where we got a bunch of money from people in small doses. And then we made a movie a few years ago called Rolling Thunder that was a movie we shot in one day. And we raised about $35,000 for that. But those are really the only times we've had actual discernible funds to do something. So it's different every time, practically. Our guest here on Radically Rational, the podcast, is up and coming and really accomplished filmmaker Peter Pardini. And you know, we've been talking about the course of your career and your aspirations, but how have the tastes of audience changed as a result of the pandemic from what you've seen? Well, I think at first, it's, it, well, it's actually interesting across just the pandemic how at first people were really into Tiger King, which was just kind of, I loved it, but it's interesting how that was so pulpy and almost TMZ, had this TMZ quality and you can't stop watching it. And then as the pandemic kind of wore on, it was it went back to kind of anger, people wanting things that were kind of very negative were kind of coming out and being propped up. But I think now that this has been going for 19 months. Exactly. That's crazy. 19 months. I see a future where more movies are like, I would say higher, I don't want to say higher quality, but just more higher budgeted Hallmark movies um, with bigger stars in it. I think people are really going to want positive. Like I, I always say, and I said this before the pandemic, but if E.T. came out right now, that movie would make $2 billion worldwide. People would flock out to see that. Um, people want to feel good about something, and it doesn't mean you only have to be positive in the movie, but I don't think people want to be hearing about everything wrong in the world right now. Uh, maybe that'll come back when things are, are really good again, because that seems to be how it goes. It's like when things are really good, there is always a faction that goes the other. It's a bell curve of life. But I think now positivity is going to really take over. Have you ever had any kind of, of, of real backlash to something that you've done as a documentary filmmaker? Any pushback at all or something that maybe somebody objected to, whether, whether that objection was valid or not? Well, with Fat, I mean, Fat a documentary, I mean, the guy who who was talking about Vinny, he espouses basically eat meat, eat green vegetables, have some nuts, and call it a day. Like, there's nothing, there's no rocket science to it. And he uh, he pushes for, um, and it works, uh, high fat, low carb. So eat red meat, but don't, don't have any carbohydrates with it. That's the problem is the carbs. So the funny thing is, when the movie comes out, it gets really, I mean, it, get, it, it, it gets good reaction, but there is a certain, I never, again, never thought in the health world that it would be so um, divisive in terms of some people who maybe follow a more plant-based diet, uh, but are moderate, don't say anything, but there's just like anything. I mean, when I made a Chicago, the Chicago documentary, there were people who were upset that, oh, Peter Cetera didn't wasn't didn't give get a voice, but they don't know that he, you ask him. He declined being <laughs> exactly. in it. Yeah. People, you know, it's uh, you know, Danny was the only guy who's basically saying what he was saying, and then it's like, well, yeah, but you know, they did. There was an acrimony there, so it's not going to be suddenly all this way. And you see the comments, oh, I can't believe they said that. It's like, that. But that's what happened. So with the health documentary, that's really the only one that's gotten pushed back because there's. Some there's in the vegan world, just like any world, 
they go on and write one-star reviews and say, this is all fake, it's all yeah. anti-science. But, you know, it's what they believe, it's fine. I don't care. Let me let me turn that question around just a little bit. Yeah. Has there ever been an occasion where you discovered something that maybe disappointed you personally or kind of changed a narrative that you had always assumed was the truth? Did, did, have you ever been crushed by something you found out? In my life? <laughs> as, a, as a filmmaker. <laughs> we, we can take this all the way back to diapers if you want to. I mean, You know, never crushed. I'll tell you the opposite, which is a funny story. There was a... Uh, I've never been crushed by finding out anything. You can kind of tell. I mean... If you're paying attention, you kind of know what everything is, if you just look at it with an even lens. But the one time where I was completely right and loved it was, so Chicago was in Clear History, the Larry David movie, mm -hmm. and they premiered at the Arclight Theater, which we used to go to all the time. So it was like really cool to go to a premiere there. And I turned around, and there's Larry David <laughs> standing alone. And I went up to him, and... I said what everyone said to him. I said, I've seen every episode of Curb multiple times, Seinfeld. And he looked at me and he went, okay. And then <laughs> he just turned around and walked away. And I was like, that's the best thing that's ever happened. Because he did exactly what I thought, what, uh, what I've seen him do is. on TV. Exactly. So if that was um, Harrison Ford and he did that, I'd be like, oh, man. What but it was Larry David, and I was like, he did the Perfect. thing. Yeah. You did what I wanted you yeah. to do. Yeah. That's great. Okay. Yeah. In, in, in selecting subject matter and projects and stuff like that, I'm, I'm not asking if it's restricted to certain subjects, but what are the common storytelling elements and motivational things in terms of storytelling technique that attracts you? I was just thinking about this the other day, how... I hate at the end of movies where there's too much dialogue. I think all of my favorite movies are uh, largely no dialogue at the end. I, I mean, th I think about early Steven Spielberg movies. Those are what drew me to making movies. And almost all of them have no words at the end of the movie. I mean, to the point where it's literally a silent movie. I mean, Close Encounters, E.T., uh, even a lot of Raiders has no dialogue besides cover your eyes. Like that's not, that's anybody could say. And it's, it's funny now, like the movies that do the best abroad, like fast and the furious. And I haven't seen those movies, but they're basically big budget silent films. It doesn't matter what they're saying. So I would say the thing that, uh, that I've been thinking a lot about is building the story and then kind of just letting it finish as a piece of entertainment at the end. Um, Cause every movie has its own, it has the same structure, even if it's varies slightly from movie to movie in terms of how it's told. But there's always, you know, the thing that makes the characters do what they do. And then there's the turning point where there's the point of no return. And then it's gets to the midpoint of the movie. And then you come to the part where, oh, everything's lost. Everything's terrible. And then the characters decide again to have another point of no return. And then the movie's over. Like, that's almost every movie. And if that doesn't happen, it's usually why the movie isn't very good. Um, so every movie's different, but, um, I don't know. I like the idea of movies being character dramas that turn into action movies at the end. So is Spielberg your favorite filmmaker? I'd say he was, um, and st still is in it in a way. Um, but there's so many, I mean, I love the Coen brothers. I love Paul Thomas Anderson. Um, I mean, everyone loves Tarantino, but. There's, I mean, I love Ingmar Bergman movies, Swedish movies from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So, um, but if I could pick, if someone could say you could have anybody's career, I would pick, yeah, Spielberg. Okay. Yeah. This has to be exciting for you because there's so much potential. Uh, there's a lot of downside to technology, and there's a lot of downside sometimes to cultural evolution. But there's so many platforms available to you now that there weren't before, and that gives you so many options in terms of subject matter, length, placement, audience. It's pretty cool. Yeah, and you have to remind yourself that 
you can forget that because it does start to feel like there is no outlet, but there is. I mean, I think that there's so much competition, but there's also so many different places you can go. And so the question just becomes, how do you get it in front of the right people there? We're still trying to figure that out, but it's cool to think that there's Netflix and Hulu and Amazon, but then there's also companies like A24 that do really small independent movies and they'll do right by the filmmaker. Even if they know that movie's probably not going to make money in the theaters, they'll still put it in the theaters. Um, we went and saw Wes Anderson's new movie uh, last week and, and it was probably percentage wise, the most people in a movie theater that we've been to since the pandemic began at least. So there is a hunger for independent, I guess not. he's not really independent anymore, but he's kind of under that banner of quirky. I mean, quirky and independent are kind of linked together when they're not always. I love hearing that the Wes Anderson movie was an indie film when it was $40 million You're or right. something. But he started as an indie filmmaker, so everyone who is an indie filmmaker kind of looks up to that and it's like, oh, that's where I want to be. But um, yeah. It's trying to find that unicorn of millions of dollars to make your movie and not have to like the short we just did. I mean, we put our own money in and did a small Indiegogo and only spent about $8,000. So we need more than that because it's just too, when people aren't getting paid and it's just too much stress to continually do that. But I think we're almost there. You're a sports dude, which I think is cool because I'm a sports dude. And what I love about it is, okay, you want reality programming. You want reality content. It doesn't get any more real than that. But it's also framed within this enormous human spirituality, but which ultimately is what sports all about. So in terms of your professional future, your filmmaking future, where might sports fit into that? Man, um, well, yeah, I've been going to San Francisco Giants games since I was a kid and uh, 49ers fan. Basics. I'm come from Central California, so it was either Northern California or Southern, and so my dad was fans of all those teams. Um, but I've always wanted to. I don't know. One of my two of my documentary dreams, you know, 12 years ago, were I'd like to go on the road with a band, and I think it would be cool to go and tour with a uh, like a baseball team or something which as you get older you realize that they probably would never allow that because they don't want cameras everywhere all the time they want to be able to control that image of the of the team the players um but i just i love sports i mean it's really those are some of the nights i look to forward to the most like when there's a warriors game on or a giants game on i know that i can like i can stop my brain from doing the other stuff um, but I've been thinking a lot lately, like about making a, we were talking about positive movies earlier. If you could make a really good Hallmark type movie, like, and when I say really good, I mean with a Hollywood budget, known actors, but combine that with a sports movie and do the, and like a Rocky. Oh, there, there would be a market for that. And the, and the yeah. timing would be perfect. always. Yeah. So, Yeah. All right, our guest is filmmaker Peter Pardini, and and I got to tell you, full disclosure here, and it it, it it does not impact in any way the quality of the production, but your uncle is Lou Pardini, who is a multi Grammy award winner and is currently a keyboardist and and lead vocalist for Chicago. Full disclosure, uh, my wife, who is in this room, there is no doubt about this. My wife would leave me for your uncle 10 minutes ago. <laughs> Am I wrong? No. No. <laughs> that soulful, like, soulful voice. Seemed like a very cool guy, too. He's great. We talk all the time. I mean, this last year and a half, especially when we're, everyone was home, we talked all the time. And it's, I do joke because he's he is he's in his own world because he's, he's sort of like, well, I'm sort of like him where – He's always, I, you can tell he's, if you know him and you're talking and he might not, it looks like he's not listening, you know that he's just like thinking of notes or something. Yeah. He's thinking of some like musical arrangement because he, he does this a lot. Like when you're talking to him, he nods 
and he closes his eyes. But he, you know, I, I can tell he's like, oh, he's not hearing what that person's saying. He's thinking about something he sang earlier. Um, but talking to him this last year and a half um, a lot, it's 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 funny because when I first started with the group, um, getting back to the whole thing of like him kind of being in another place, it was actually my aunt who when – Lee was looking for someone to do a behind the scenes for the Christmas album. Um, my aunt was the one who said, oh, well, our nephew just graduated from college as a film student, and he'd probably do it. And then Lou backed her up on that. Yeah. But I always think it's funny because it was actually, I have my aunt to thank for <laughs> <laughs> putting my name out there and then Lou going, yeah, 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 you'd be good. But that's the yeah. way these things happen, it's for sure. It's how everything happens. I mean, you can't, there's no... Yeah, there's no way to get in, and it's almost always somebody you know that ends up leading to something else. I mean, at this point, I mean, that's how it's going to be anyways, because now I have stuff that's out there that people can see. So it's always going to be based off of, you know, oh, I, I love Chicago, and I saw that, and we have this documentary, and we want you to do it. So it's great. Do you have some kind of Captain Ahab career <laughs> obsession? This is just something i got to get. i got to win this one. Um, no, not Captain Ahab, but obsessive, yeah. <laughs> so if he's obsessive, then yeah, I yeah. I tend to catastrophize, as I've said. Um, everything, every little thing is a big thing uh, to me. So I have to fix it. You know what I mean? I think that's why I'm a really good editor is because... I've had, you know, movies that I've done where I'm the only editor on it, and then, and then you submit it, and then I have gotten the comment a lot from the quality control people at whatever distributor it is, is that we've never had a movie before that didn't have a fix. Like, there's nothing... You passed quality control the first time. Like, there's no little errors in the sound. There's no little errors in the video. <clears throat> And I think it's because I, when I go over a section and she can hear it from downstairs where she can hear the same two-minute section over and over and over again in anything I'm editing. So obsessive, yeah. More like Jack Nicholson in As Good As It Gets. Okay, good. <laughs> Perfect. So you, you've mentioned that you fell in love with filmmaking uh, around the eighth grade and that you were inspired by other people and other projects. Do you get a chance to talk to people who are currently in the eighth grade and maybe aspiring future filmmakers? And, and, and if so, what do you tell them? It was, uh, I was at the Austin Film Society Theater um, a few, couple months ago. And it's just really weird. So I'm sitting there with a, uh, a friend of mine. And then I look over and I see a guy with a giant's hat on. And I just point to him and give him a thumbs up. And he's got a mask on, so I, I don't see his face. But I just pointed because of the giant's logo. He then comes over to me and he says, are you Peter Pardini? And I, I was like, yeah. <laughs> and he said, oh, yeah, I went to your high school in, in Fresno, California, you wrote me a letter of recommendation to get into school, and I had completely forgotten that because is a very cool story. He had been connected to me through someone at my high school. I went to a small Catholic school, and so everyone knows everyone. And so they said, "Oh, he's a filmmaker. He should write you a letter of recommendation." And we've become friends. And so I've just, you know, it's always the same questions. It's it's usually, you know, well, how do you do that or how do you? And it's there is no way. The only way is to continue to do the thing that you're doing and then you'll start to realize that other people you started out with aren't doing it anymore and you still are and that's kind of where I am right now is that a lot of the people I know aren't doing it anymore there's a few but for the most part it's just for whatever reason it didn't work out um, and I always feel like every day it's not going to work out but it's it pushes me to do more and to try to like kick enough dust up that something will land in the right place. You have an extremely cool website. Uh, tell <laughs> folks about it. You do. Thanks. That's Wix.com. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> now I picked a template off of Wix, but I, I like the, the very minimal 
style, just white on black. And uh, it's peterpardini.com. And uh, yeah, it's my I got my reel up there and a little bio and some of the past short work that I've done. Um, so yeah, it's just about trying to, I guess, brand yourself. I, I hate that word, but it is, there is something to it because I have this theory about Hollywood, about how all the, if you notice all of the directors or most of them who get full creative control have a foreign accent, like a British accent, Christopher Nolan, the guy, huh? Christopher Nolan. He's British. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. there's there's different there's it, but that I think branding wise that's not a racial thing or a you know a bias thing. It's everything sounds better when someone talks like this. So you think and Denis Villeneuve who do, who just did Dune. I mean he gets he makes great movies. And then the other thing I notice about American directors is it's always a duo, which I find interesting. So it's it's a double two people who. And that's another branding. So I've been trying to figure out what <laughs> my branding would be other than just trying to make good movies. But, um, yeah, it's it's interesting. Always trying to navigate, I guess, uh, putting your best foot forward um, in some way without it. Because I don't want to – I'm never going to be the guy who starts wearing, like, a beret <laughs> or stupid clothes to, to look like something, to look like a director. But – you do have to kind of start thinking, well, what would help that isn't a lie about you? How could you, you have be, to be associated with something? There how could you be, be yourself a, a, without a, being fake? Yeah. Well, see, now, yeah. that, now that you're <laughs> in Texas, it's way easier. And you were talking about filmmakers being duos. Well, you, you, you could, in Texas, you can be your own duo, like Billy Bob. Or, <laughs> right. Or, you know, that, that well, I did add my middle that, name. So. I added my middle name to uh, to my director's name. It used to just be Peter Pardini. And I thought, well, maybe Peter Curtis Pardini would sound more... Because it's my real name, let's just use that. And so I've I've had a few people look at my credit card and go, "Oh, that's a cool name," but I don't know. I don't know if people are just being nice. Peter has been just an absolute pleasure. I've enjoyed our previous conversations on the phone. Getting the chance to meet you face to face is wonderful. Same here. Welcome to Texas. Bring whatever sanity here you can. We really <laughs> appreciate that, Katie. What a pleasure meeting you, and and I'm sure my wife will have some message that she'll try to get to your uncle. So, oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we thank you so much for being with us. We want to refer you to our website at radicallyrational.com. Remember, we're about bringing facts back into fashion, making simple sanity sexy again. If you go there on a daily basis, got a news blog, got a sports blog, got daily videos. These podcasts are put up in a prominent place. Uh, we're very, very grateful for your support and your interest, and we can't wait until the next time we see you right here on Radically Rational, the podcast. <laughs>